All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight, we're starting a new sutra. Yay! So we concluded our 23-week study of the Upaya Sutra. And today, this evening, we're going to start a five-part series on the now this is another sutra that has a few different names but for this series i think we're going to stick with just the upali sutra it's technically called the upali paripricha sutra the questions of upali so that'll be our sutra um, I'll have more to say about its other name. It has a, a different title. Um, but let me kind of just start to ease us into this. So <clears throat> I decided that I wanted to do one more sutra from our uh, Treasury of Mahayana Sutras from the Maharatnakuta collection. And, you know, I was looking back at Dharmador's past. And we've almost done every sutra in this book. I think there's a few we haven't that I'm just not really interested in doing in that way. But so I've done almost every one that I wanted to do. And then there's this little sutra. It's pretty short. But the reason why I wanted to do this sutra is it's a really good uh it's a really good follow-up actually to the last sutra that we did. And it's actually kind of a good follow-up to a lot of the sutras that we've done lately in terms of a lot of the sutras we've been working on have been about the Bodhisattva path. And this one is also about the Bodhisattva path. But I feel like this one is going to conclude a lot of ideas that we've been talking about. And then That'll be, again, this is going to be a five-part series. And then in July, I'm coming up to San Francisco for an in-person Dharma Doors workshop. And that's on July 23rd from 1 to 4 p.m. So I'll be up there. I'll be up in San Francisco for that. And then after that, when we return to the online Dharma Doors, um, I'm going to return to the Pali Canon, to the earlier Buddhist sutras, and we're going to kind of go back to some of the earlier teachings. So this will be our kind of our last deep exploration of the Bodhisattva path. So I just felt like there was a few more things to say about that. And this sutra is perfect for that. So, so there's that. <clears throat> and if you have the big yellow book, this sutra is on page 262. This sutra is number 24 of the 49 sutras in the Ratnakuta collection, even though, of course, it's number 15 here, but just so you know. You should also know that there is a translation of this sutra also from the Tibetan. And tonight I'm actually going to read a little bit from that Tibetan version <clears throat> only because. It's one of those situations where they decided to leave a few things out. They, they decided you didn't want to know <clears throat> about a few things. So we're going to have to refer to the Tibetan. But then I'm going to jump back to this one because I ultimately like this language better. So you should know that. That sort of brings me to the other name of this sutra. Because in the Tibetan, this sutra is known as the what is it, the Vinaya Vinshachaya, Vinshachaya Sutra. The, well, <clears throat> they actually translate it as the definitive Vinaya or Vinaya, or it could be translated as uh, determining the Vinaya. So, we're going to have to have a quick conversation about that title 
because not everybody might be familiar with the word vinaya or vinaya. So, and of course the vinaya, this idea of the vinaya is connected to the other title, which is the Upali Sutra. So let me just break that down really quickly. So this sutra, at least in the Sanskrit, and then the Chinese translation of the Sanskrit, the title is the Upali Paripricha Sutra, which is the questions of Upali. And if you've been coming to the Dharma doors and you've been following along with our reading of the sutras from this book, there are a number of different sutras that are the so-and-so Paripricha Sutra. The questions of so and so. <laughs> so it's a it's a format. It is like a it's a yeah it's a format of a sutra. And most sutras are actually in the format of a question and answer. But then some of them, the sutras are all about the question and answer in that way. And so. This sutra is the questions of Upali. And if you don't know who Upali is, Upali is one of the Buddha's 10 chief disciples. He's right up there with Madhulyayana, Shariputra, Subhuti, all of the other ones. The story about Upali is that he also was part of the... Um, he wasn't a family member, at least I don't think he was related to the Buddha, but he was part of the royal um, staff, I believe. But he was, he was kind of part of the Buddha's extended family. So when the Buddha went back to get everybody, his, you know, his, his mother, his aunt, his wife, he also gets this guy, Upali. Upali was a barber. I think by trade, like that was what he was originally. Then he runs off with the Buddha, becomes an arhat. And then the story about Upali that is the most important for us is that after the Buddha passed away at the first council, so the big first gathering of the arhats after the Buddha died, there was this big council and at that council, that is when Ananda, the Buddha's cousin, stood up and said, oh, I remember all the sutras. I remember all the teachings that the Buddha gave. And that's when Ananda, at the first council, recited and said, I, Ananda, thus have I heard one time the Buddha was at such and such a place and he did this, and thus have I, Ananda, heard, thus the Buddha was at such and such a place. So you should know, if you didn't know this, that every Buddhist sutra begins with the phrase, thus have I heard, and the I, the person who heard, was Ananda, at least traditionally. And there's a few sutras in which that's not the case, but for the most part. So Ananda recites all the sutras. Shariputra at the first council recites all of the Abhidharma, all of the kind of the lists and the deeper teachings or de deeper explanations of the Dharma, the Abhidharma. <clears throat> and then there was Upali. Upali stood up at the first council and he said, oh, and I remember all of the rules that the Buddha prescribed. I remember all the precepts. I remember all the monastic discipline. So Upali at the first council recites what becomes known as the Vinaya or the Vinaya. And that word vinaya or vinaya means discipline. That's like what that word means, the discipline. So then in the vinaya, in the discipline, is all of the precepts, all of the rules, but not only 
the rule, like, you know, um, whatever the rule is, eating one meal a day before the hour of noon, that's a rule. It's in the Vinaya. But what the Vinaya, what Upali recounted at the first council, he recounted the story about how it is that that became a rule. And in many ways, in terms of like the study of the Dharma, the study of the Vinaya, it's really helpful that we have such a documented record of not only the rules, but why the rules were implemented in the first place. So Upali is like the master of the Vinaya. And that's why the other title of this sutra is this idea of the definitive Vinaya or the, 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 the determining what the real Vinaya is. And that's because not tonight, I don't know when it's going to happen exactly, but at a certain point, Upali is going to stand up and he's going to ask the Buddha some questions about the Vinaya. And that's going to be sort of where the sutra is going to get its title from. But that's not going to happen tonight. So let's just hold off on Upali and the Vinaya and all of that. Um, it, and I think, uh, Noam, did you, by the way, did you got all those links? Oh, cool. So Noam put in the chat the link to the translation from the Tibetan. And there's also a link to a website that is dedicated to the Maharatnakuta collection. And that website has like, it's a really detailed bibliography of this sutra, like all the different translations and all the different studies of this sutra. It's just a great reference for the Maharatna Kuta collection. So from that website, what we learn is that there is, we have a few Sanskrit fragments of this sutra but we do not have a complete full original Sanskrit version of it. But there were three very old Chinese translations that were made from the Sanskrit. And of course, the one in this book is from one of those, San one of those Chinese translations. There's a Tibetan translation, which has then been translated into English. And you have the link to that. So, we actually have a pretty decent um, body of records regarding this sutra. So that's good, especially when we have a, the Tibetan, because as you know, at least if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you know that Tibetan translations are very close to Sanskrit translations. So if we have a Tibetan translation of something, we basically have a Sanskrit translation. So, okay. So those are sort of the background of this whole sutra. Um, let's go ahead and dive in. So here's the situation. <laughs> Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was dwelling in the garden of Anathapindika, in the Jetta Grove, near Shravasti, accompanied by 1,250 great bhikshus, monks, and 500,000 bodhisattva mahasattvas. The world-honored one, the Bhagavan, cast his eyes upon the assembly and surveyed it like a Naga king or like an elephant king. Then the Buddha asked the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, Kulaputra, noble children, which one of you can, in the last era, protect and uphold the true Dharma? Which one of you can embrace the Dharma leading to supreme enlightenment? The Dharma which took the Tathagata incalculable hundreds of thousands of millions of billions of myriads of kalpas to accumulate. And who can abide securely in the secret 
esoteric teachings in order to bring sentient beings to maturity by various upaya. <laughs> All right. So there's actually a number of things that we need to talk about just in that opening paragraph. So the first thing, so, you know, pretty standard as far as being in Shravasti, in Anatha Pindika's park. I've talked about Shravasti and Anatha Pindika's park in other Dharma doors classes. So we're not going to get into that. The standard number 1250 bhikshus is a very common standard number. And then 500,000 bodhisattvas. Excellent. Then the Buddha looks over the scene and he asks this question. Which one of you can, in the last era, protect and uphold the true Dharma? So we're about to hear from a long list of bodhisattvas. But before I read their, the way that they respond to this, we need to break down exactly what the Buddha asks. So I want to start with actually the language of the last era, right? Yeah, in the Tibetan translation here, it just says in the future. But there's a very specific reference that's being made here. And I don't always talk about it. It's not something that comes up often. So let me go into a little bit of detail about it. So you may or may not know that within the world of Buddhism, and not just Mahayana Buddhism, all the Buddhisms, all forms of Buddhism, there is what is called, just what is conventionally called, the prophecy of decline. And the prophecy of decline is a prediction, a prophecy that the Buddha made about the declining and the ultimate disappearance of the Dharma from the world. Now, if this is a, if everything that I'm about to get into, if it's of interest to you, I highly recommend this book, Once Upon a Future Time, Studies in a Buddhist Prophecy of Decline by Jan Natier. So this is a great book that is only, all this book is about is this idea that within the world of Buddhism, there's a prophecy that it, the Buddha, that the Dharma is going to go out of existence. Now, if you read this book, like I was kind of reading or rereading this afternoon, um, Jan Natier, she goes, she goes through a, uh, all of the sources of information for this prophecy of decline. And there's actually many different versions of it. In particular, there are many different versions of exactly how long it's going to take for the Dharma to decline and disappear. So without going into great detail about that book, eventually the timetable of decline becomes pretty standardized. And the standard timetable that the Buddha predicted for the decline of the Dharma, the standard one is that he said, supposedly, the real Dharma, like the true Dharma that I'm speaking, this is the Buddha, he's like, the real Dharma that I've taught you, it will last for 500 years. And then the Dharma, the teachings, they're going to move into a thousand year period of like mediocre Dharma. And the mediocre Dharma is this period in which not all of the sutras you read will be real sutras, but there will be real sutras still out there in the world. Not all translations will be accurate, but there will be some accurate ones. Not all renunciants, or I should say, not all people who have taken precepts will follow those precepts. 
but there will be people who are still following the precepts correctly. So it's this kind of thousand year period of like, mm, it depends. And then after that 500, after that thousand year period, there's a 500 period, a 500 year period of what is called the, the end of the Dharma, the fake Dharma. And the descriptions of that last 500 year period, it will be a period in which no sutra has been translated correctly. They are all slightly wrong. All precept holders are breaking the precepts to some degree or another. Nobody is actually holding down the real Dharma. And ultimately, in the last 500 year period, you can't get enlightened here. <laughs> you can still go to another Buddha land, or you can go to like a more exalted heavenly realm to practice. But if you're going to stay here on earth in that way, there in the last 500 year period, there is no hope of enlightenment. And then, at least according to the prophecy, no more Dharma. Until Maitreya gets here at some very distant time. So <laughs> that's the prophecy of decline. Now, the time period in which, like again, if you if you read Professor Natier's book, the time period for these prophecies of decline all seem to be around 1500 years or so after the Buddha. Meaning that a lot of these prophecies of decline are from the medieval period and they are writing from where they understand themselves to be in the last 500 year period. So that's the, now that means that we are in the period of no dharma. And that kind of draws into question this timetable, of course, because here we are studying sutras every Sunday night. Now, I'm not saying they're the best translations and they're totally accurate, but the dharma is still in the world. So take all of this prophecy of decline stuff with a grain of salt. So just want you to know that there's a lot of different interpretations of this and a lot of different timetables in that way. So it's only in the kind of the normal standard timetable in which we, we're just outside of the Dharma in that way. And by the way, while I'm on the topic of this, I do want you to know that a lot of medieval Buddhist philosophy, in particular the philosophy or the teachings around what becomes known as pure land Buddhism, the idea of like uh, praying or revering or chanting the name of a Buddha and then being able to go to their Buddha land. The idea is, is that that philosophy of the pure lands where you can go to practice the Dharma with a real Buddha a lot of that comes out of this feeling that a lot of the Buddhist world seems to have had in the medieval period, that they were in this apocalyptic time of the end of the Dharma. And so because they were under the impression that you couldn't get enlightened here anymore, there was actually no more reason to really cultivate here. You, you did meditation in order to go to a Buddha land to then get enlightened. So Buddhism, like certain types of Buddhism arise out of this prophecy of decline in that way. So, and also I want you to know too, not everybody was into this idea of the prophecy of decline. But this sutra is presuming that the Buddha, so also you should know, this sutra, like all sutras, is acting as if this is coming from the mouth of the Buddha, like in 500 BC. But he's speaking of this prophecy in which the, the Dharma will eventually come to an end. And so what he's asking 
is, hey, bodhisattvas, who among you in that last 500 period, 500 year period where things are so bad, who among you can protect and uphold the true Dharma, right? Which one of you can embrace the Dharma, which leads to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi? Um, and of course, which of you can abide securely in the esoteric teachings to bring sentient beings to maturity by various upaya? Okay, so that's my comment on the last era. That's sort of what it's referring to. Any questions about the last era? Hmm. The next thing I want to mention really quickly about this first question, the Buddha asks, which one of you can, and then protect the Dharma and do all these things. So if you're looking at the Tibetan, if you're reading the Tibetan version, and you're contrasting it with the Chinese, you might notice a difference of language. And this is actually, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend time on this if I didn't think it was significant. So in the Tibetan version, it has the Buddha saying, who among you wishes, wishes, like wants to protect the Dharma in the last age and all of that? So in the Tibetan, the question is, who wants to protect the Dharma? Who wishes to protect the Dharma? Whereas in the Chinese translation here, it's about which one of you can protect the true Dharma? And actually, I, I personally wouldn't translate it either of those ways. And that's because there's a particular word that's being used in, in all versions of this. And again, I wouldn't spend time if this wasn't kind of important or at least interesting. The particular word that's being kind of referenced, at least in Chinese, it's this very conspicuous term, uh, kan ren. And kan ren is a word, it's a phrase, it's a two character, it's a binomial phrase. And kan ren means it means like to, to bear, like if you were to put something on your shoulder and actually I forget if it's con or ren, but one of those characters is it's specifically about like uh, bur uh, carrying something on your shoulder in a way, but by extension, it doesn't mean to literally carry on your shoulder, but it means like to bear. And the reason th th why I'm focusing on this is because this same exact kanren is the word that you find in the Vimalakirti Sutra, the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, that I'm, I'm always talking about this Mahayana Sutra. And if you've read that sutra, you'll know that it starts with this guy, Vimalakirti, who's like the star of the sutra, and he's gotten sick. And the Buddha says to all of his, uh, all the monks, and says to all of the bodhisattvas, hey, you all should go ask about Vimalakirti's illness. You should all go check on Vimalakirti. And then one by one, each of the monks and then one by one, each of the bodhisattvas, they all say, I couldn't bear to go visit Vimalakirti because one time I was teaching the Dharma and he told me I was doing it all wrong and he you know, totally schooled me. And what I want you to know is, is that there's a really funny, it's like a, it's a play of words, sort of. And what it, is is you know how like in in english in english if we were to say like i can't stand whatever 
there's a way in which we are saying like, I can't tolerate it, but then we're also kind of saying, I can't bear it. Even in English, when we say like, oh, I can't bear to wait, I can't bear to do this. It's this kind of, um, th that phrase to bear, it just has a few different meanings and it does in the sutra. And so I want you to know, because it's going to come up a few times, there's a lot of interesting overlap between this sutra, the Upali Sutra, and the Vimalakirti Sutra. And this conspicuous use of the term kanren is like the beginning of these overlaps. So rather than, or possibly, rather than tra translating this of, who among you would like or who wishes to protect the Dharma or who among you can protect the Dharma? It's more about who among you can bear to protect the Dharma in the future. And it's twofold. It's like, it's going to be hard to do it. So do you have what it takes? Can you bear it? But then also, like, do you have the integrity to, to bear it? in that sense. So then each of the bodhisattvas is going to respond using that verb, the verb of to bear or to stand in that way. So, okay. So which one of you bodhisattvas can bear to embrace the Dharma leading to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi the Dharma which took the Buddha incalculable hundreds of thousands of millions of period, millions of billions of myriads of kalpas to accumulate. And who among you can abide securely in the esoteric teachings, All right? Okay. This is where I'm going to pause and I'm going to read from the Tibetan, and here's why. Beginning with Maitreya, the future Buddha, we are about to go down a list of, I think I counted 50, 55, 55 bodhisattvas. But if you have the translation from Chinese, from the Chinese, you'll notice there aren't 55 bodhisattvas. And that's because they just start sporadically taking out bodhisattvas. Not like the first 10 or the last 10, but just every now and then, like oh, that one's, that's a boring one. <laughs> like, I don't really know who made the decision that you, you, you don't want to hear what Manjushri has to say. Forget Manjushri. <laughs> so I'm a little upset, or as usual, I don't like this translation because it drops things without any explanation. In fact, this is the only time, I won't show you, you won't be able to see it, but in this book, the authors, the editors, the translators, whoever, they use the little ellipses, the little three dots, to indicate to you, the reader, that something's missing. We're not gonna tell you how much though. It might be a word, I've actually seen in here where it's a single word and I've seen where it, it's pages and pages and pages of text that are missing and they don't tell you. They're just like, yeah, we took something out. <laughs> don't you want to know what it is? And this one on page 262, it actually has a footnote and the footnote says, ellipses indicate missing text. But they only tell you that after 262 pages. So this is edited, edited very poorly is what I mean to say. I digress. So we're going to refer, I'm going to read from the Tibetan just on this portion, just this section. And I'm going to do it because the Tibetan has all of them. And because the Tibetan has all of the bodhisattvas Sanskrit names, which is kind of like their real name, 
insofar as the names of these bodhisattvas have mantric qualities, like insofar as the names are significant in their original Sanskrit, it's nice that the Tibetan version has their original Sanskrit names. So, after the Buddha asks the bodhisattvas, oh, and in terms of sutra study, I would love for you all to notice how we didn't get the normal list of all the bodhisattvas that were there. This is, this is functioning as the list, but this is an interesting way to do it. I've never actually seen a sutra that does it this way. So something to note. But after asking all the bodhisattvas who can bear to protect the Dharma in the Dharma ending age, then the bodhisattva mahasattva Maitreya, the friendly one, the future Buddha, arose from his seat, adjusted his upper robe of his shoulder, of his right shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground, bowed to the world honored one, and with his palms joined in devotion said, Bhagavan, world honored one, for the sake of upholding the holy dharma in the future, in the latter times, I wish, or I can, or I can bear to take up the unsurpassed, completely perfect awakening that took the Tathagata countless myriads of kalpas to accomplish. So Maitreya said, I can, world honored one. Then the Bodhisattva Lion, the Bodhisattva Simha, said, world honored one, I can bear to nurture beings using various upaya, various ways, and various ideas. The Bodhisattva Vajrapani said, world honored one, I can bear to release beings from going to the lower realms. The Bodhisattva Youthful Manju Shri said, World Honored One, I can bear to fulfill the aspirations of all sentient beings. The Bodhisattva Nyana Ketu, Banner of Knowledge, said, World Honored One, I can bear to bring untold numbers of beings to maturity. The Bodhisattva Dharma Ketu, Dharma Banner, said, World Honored One, I can bear to bring beings to maturity through the gift of the Dharma. The Bodhisattva Moon Banner, Chandra Ketu, said, World Honored One, I can bear to bring beings to maturity by means of all good qualities. The Bodhisattva Sun Banner, Surya Ketu said, world honored one, I can bear to bring beings to maturity by means of the easy vehicle. The Bodhisattva Nihashanka said, world honored one, I can bear to bring the limitless realms of sentient beings to maturity and support them. The Bodhisattva Bhadrapala said, world honored one, I can bear to bring beings to maturity by proclaiming the names they are to attain as a result, meaning the names as Buddhas. The Bodhisattva inexhaustible intellect Akshayamati said, world honored one, I can bear to liberate inexhaustible realms of beings through extensive aspirations or vows. The Bodhisattva Youthful Chandra Prabha, Youthful Moonlight, said, World Honored One, I wish or I can bear to supply beings with all the requisites of happiness. The Bodhisattva Good Eye, Sunetra, said, world honored one, I can bear to establish the foundation for the happiness and contentment of all sentient beings. 
The Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara said, world honored one, I can bear to protect all beings from lower realms and bad rebirths. The Bodhisattva Mahashtama Prapta said, world honored one, I can bear to save beings who have not escaped from the lower realms. The Bodhisattva Rashika said, world honored one, I can bear to teach undisciplined beings the way of discipline, Vinaya. The Bodhisattva Sumanas said, world honored one, I can bear to bring beings with inferior inclinations to maturity. The Bodhisattva Surata said, world honored one, I can bear to bring beings with inferior wisdom to maturity. The Bodhisattva Tejorashi said, world honored one, I can bear to bring beings who have been born from the wombs of animals to maturity. The Bodhisattva recognizer of unafflicted realization. So we don't have a Sanskrit name for that, but the Bodhisattva recognizer of unafflicted realization said, world honored one, I can bear to bring beings to maturity by correctly teaching them the way. The Bodhisattva Priyadarshana said, world honored one, I wish to equip beings with the immeasurable requisites of happiness. The Bodhisattva Excellent Faculty said, World Honored One, I can bear to bring beings to maturity by causing them to reflect upon suffering. The Bodhisattva Engaged in Inconceivable Liberation said, World Honored One, with merely a thought, I can bear to liberate beings born in the world of hungry ghosts, pretas. The Bodhisattva Surya Prabha Sunlight said, World Honored One, I can bear to bring to maturity those beings who are not yet mature. The Bodhisattva Vimalakirti said, World Honored One, I can bear to fulfill every intention that beings have. The Bodhisattva Tejor Bala said, world honored one, I can bear to destroy the way beings take unfortunate rebirths. The Bodhisattva Vimati Prahanya said, world honored one, I can bear to liberate inferior beings. The Bodhisattva Nihashan Kastana said, world honored one, for the sake of gathering beings, I wish to express. For the sake of gathering beings, I wish to express encouragement to them by saying, "Wonderful." <laughs> I didn't see that one the first time. That one's great. <laughs> the Bodhisattva Nyana Shri said, "World honored one, I can bear to bring beings to maturity according to their very predispositions or their varying predispositions. The Bodhisattva boundless stillness said, world honored one, I can bear to teach beings the way of the unconditioned. The Bodhisattva fearless, ah, the Bodhisattva fearless towards all phenomena said, world honored one, I can bear to teach beings according to their own predisposition. The Bodhisattva Ratna Shri said, world honored one, I can bear to display a heap of jewels to beings. The Bodhisattva Sumati said, world honored one, I can bear to bring beings to maturity by showing them a beautiful form. The Bodhisattva Vimala Tejas said, world honored one, I can bear to support and bring beings to maturity through affection. The Bodhisattva Mani Bhadra said, world honored one, I can bear to bring, bring beings to maturity by causing them to remember their past rebirths. 
the Bodhisattva Punya Rashmi said, World Honored One, I can bear to guide beings by means of perfect aspirational prayers. The Bodhisattva Bhadra Shri said, World Honored One, I can bear to permanently liberate beings from suffering. The Bodhisattva Ratnapani, the jeweled hand, said, World Honored One, I can bear to make beings happy with jewels. The Bodhisattva Mati, mind, said, World Honored One, I can bear to end the poverty of poor beings. The Bodhisattva Sarvani Varanya Vishkambin said, World Honored One, I can bear to liberate beings from all their afflictions. The Bodhisattva Vajra Light said, World Honored One, I can bear to teach beings the exalted way. The Bodhisattva manifesting the appearance of good qualities said, World Honored One, I can, I can bear to liberate beings by causing all their thoughts to be joyful. The Bodhisattva exalted Dharma said, World Honored One, I can bear to show the pure eye of the Dharma, the pure Dharma eye to all beings. The Bodhisattva Vajra Garbha said, World Honored One, I can bear to liberate beings from all their obstructions. The Bodhisattva Dharmakara said, World Honored One, I can bear to liberate beings through the Dharma. <laughs> the Bodhisattva Nothing <laughs> said, World Honored One, I, I can bear to eliminate all the poisons, all the poisonous afflictions of beings. The Bodhisattva Full Moon, Chandratada, said, World Honored One, I can bear to teach the perspective of the Dharma to beings. The Bodhisattva Simhamati, lion-like intellect, said, World Honored One, I can bear to give the gift of the Dharma to all beings. The Bodhisattva Luminous Youth said, World Honored One, I can bear to liberate beings from inferior states. The Bodhisattva Glorious Awakening said, World Honored One, I can bear to block beings' ways to lower rebirths by teaching them the exalted way. The Bodhisattva Suvarnya Prabha said, World Honored One, I can bear to bring beings to maturity by displaying a physical body. The Bodhisattva Punya Ketu said, World Honored One, I can bear to help those beings who help others. The Bodhisattva Jagatindara, upholder of the age, said, World Honored One, I can bear to destroy beings gateway, gateway into hell. The Bodhisattva Nectar Holder said, World Honored One, I can bear to save beings from samsara. And finally, the youthful Bodhisattva Jalini Prabha said, World Honored One, in the future, in the latter times, I can bear to bring peace to beings of afflictions through displays of light. All right. So before I move on, anything come up? Any questions about any of those? Yeah, no. Not a question, but a, a comment. It was that was a super cool list of things. <laughs> and it made me feel like, oh, there's lots of ways to keep the Dharma going. Not just one way. You can do any of those things and probably more. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh no, such a great comment. And it's such a great comment because that is exactly how you should read this. As exactly like, wow, there's so many different ways. That's so great. Um, 
and also sort of reading it as like a bunch of beautiful ideas just sort of like wafting over you. I really feel like that's how one should read a section like this in that way. Like this is not exactly prescriptions for behavior so much as, yeah, just having the Dharma sort of reign over us, as they say. Um, by the way, just really quickly, I will want to mention that a lot of those bodhisattvas are the bodhisattvas that appear in the Vimalakirti Sutra. You may have caught that Vimalakirti was even one of the bodhisattvas. So again, I'm going to keep pointing out uh, overlap with that Vimalakirti Sutra. So. Okay, but now I am going to switch back to this book because I do ultimately prefer the way that this reads in that way. And I know, well, now everybody has access to the one online, but. So after all the bodhisattvas, you know, re, uh, declare how they will protect the Dharma in the latter times, when Shariputra heard the bodhisattvas, valiantly make these great vows to bring sentient beings to maturity, he marveled at this unprecedented event and said to the Buddha, most extraordinary, world honored one, these bodhisattvas are inconceivable. They are filled with great compassion and upaya. They adorn themselves with valor and vigor. They cannot be fathomed or corrupted by any being, nor can they be outshone by any brilliance. World honored one, says Shariputra, I will extol the extraordinary feats of the bodhisattvas. And then he's going to tell us about the bodhisattvas. But I want to mention something really quickly. So, yeah, so this description, Shariputra says, wow, like, wow, these bodhisattvas, they're so extraordinary, right? First of all, they're inconceivable. I'm not going to get too into that right now, but we are going to come back to it. He says, this is Shariputra. Wow, they are filled with great compassion and upaya, or you know what they translate as ingenuity, but you'll remember from the last sutra, ingenuity is skillful means or upaya. And the one reason why I want to pause really quickly, the last sutra that we did on the U upaya sutra, you know, we spent a lot a long time on that sutra and there was sort of, uh, and I definitely kind of emphasized this in my summary of it last week, there's like one thing or two things, I guess I should say, that kind of makes a, the bodhisattva the bodhisattva and that it's compassion is number one and upaya, skillful means. And what, I'm, what I mean is, in the last sutra, we were learning about how, yes, a bodhisattva follows precepts and they observe a kind of moral discipline in that way, but their highest calling, their highest commitment is actually to loving kindness and compassion for all sentient beings and the use of upaya in order to make beings happy, bring them to maturity, all kinds of things. So I just wanted to point out that that idea, like what's up with a bodhisattva? Compassion and upaya. That's what's up with the bodhisattva. And we kind of, we learned why in the last sutra. And I just want to draw your attention to Shariputra saying, wow, these bodhisattvas, they're so compassionate and they're so in, ingenious in that sense. They're so upayak. And then I also wanted to mention this beautiful idea. It's, it's an idea that I'm very interested in. It's something I'm really kind of studying. And it's the Mahayana 
idea of adornments. I'm very interested in these idea of adornments. Now, the only thing that I want to mention about it now is that these adornments of a bodhisattva, it's so interesting. And what's so interesting about it is that in the Hinayana, in the early form of Buddhism, there is a prohibition against adornments. But they're talking about earrings, jewelry, makeup, even clothing to a certain degree. So it's this idea of like adornments, you know, to make yourself more beautiful in that way. And that type of, mm, you know, making oneself beautiful or whatever in the Hinayana, that was considered a vice. That was considered a problem. And so in the Hinayana, no adornments. It's not that in the Mahayana, it's not that they are into jewelry and that they're into that type of beautification. But what's interesting about the Mahayana and the Bodhisattva path is that they are, though, still interested in adornments. But they have a different idea of what constitutes an adornment. And the basic idea or a basic, you know, this, this one refers to the Bodhisattva as being adorned with valor, but it's really about merit in that way or virtue and vigor, virya. So virtue and vigor are the, these two. And an example that I use a lot to describe these types of adornments you take, for example, something like being um, like, or you take, for example, false speech, being deceptive versus kind speech and truthful speech, right? Avoiding false speech. Well, the idea is, that, or the way that the language of adornments, one of the ways that the language is used in, in the Mahayana tradition is that a bodhisattva adorns themselves with virtue. And what that means is, is that you start to see it as a bodhisattva is beautiful because they're honest. And it's kind of ugly to be deceptive and to lie. And so, in the Mahayana, they start talking about things like being honest as an adornment. And then they start talking about the bodhisattva adorning themselves, but with virtues. And at first, at first, this can sound like metaphorical. But the more you think about it, or at least the more I have thought about it, the more I have realized it's not metaphorical. <laughs> it's actually adorning, but you have to kind of overcome a certain idea of what constitutes adornment and come over to the idea of what is really beautiful in that way. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, it's like, oh yeah, those are much more beautiful adornments than, you know, I don't know. <laughs> a bunch of gaudy jewelry or something in that way. So nothing against jewelry, but that idea that these are these specific kind of almost metaphysical adornments. So, all right. And they can't be fathomed or corrupted by any being. Okay. So then Shariputra says, unless there's any comments or ideas about any of that, those are just little, little asides. So Shariputra says, dick -a -dick -a -dick, uh, I, world honored one, I will now extol the extraordinary feats of the bodhisattvas. They can freely give anything that they have to anyone who asks for it, including their heads, 
their eyes, their ears, their noses, their bodies, hands, and feet. World Honored One, I often think that if a bodhisattva is not afraid or faint-hearted, even when forced to give up all that they have, external and internal, then the bodhisattva must be an inconceivable liberated bodhisattva. So this is where I want to pause for a moment to remind you that this is Shariputra saying this. And what we want to remember, at least in terms of Dharma doors, is that we read these sutras allegorically. And so Shariputra sort of represents the Hinayana. And Shariputra is sort of like, wow, these bodhisattvas, they are so virtuous, so generous, that they can even give away their head to anybody that asks for it. And Shariputra is in awe of that. And for him, for Shariputra, that makes the bodhisattva inconceivable unfathomable. I wanted to pause on this for a second to just remind you, if you hear that, if you hear that a bodhisattva is someone that would give away their own hands and eyes to anybody that asks, if you're thinking, that sounds like that's pretty serious. It is. Nobody is actually saying it's easy. And in fact, Shariputra is saying that's what makes a bodhisattva utterly inconceivable. Because for most of us, that's inconceivable. It is utterly inconceivable that I would give up my eyes, my hands, my ears, and not only give them up, but to anybody, anybody that asks, even like my worst enemy anybody. Indeed, that is inconceivable giving. And so again, I just wanted to remind you that if you heard that and you're a little taken aback, Shariputra is taken aback. So, okay. And also notice too the language, because I think this language is so interesting. It's the language about being able to give up everything external and internal. External is my stuff. Internal is my eyes, my ears, my organs, all of that. So when they talk about that, but I would also want to remind you, this is like for the, like the real Dharma heads out there. I want to remind you that I mentioned maybe in the last sutra that Buddhism, the, the Dharma, has always been suggesting that you let go of attachment to the body. It has always been, the Buddha has always been asking you to give up your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, your body. It has always been the case that that has been the Dharma. And so when somebody comes along and says, hey, can I have your eyes? There's a way of hearing that and understanding that that is a, it's not about like gouge out your eyes and give them to me. It's a question of how far along are you in your attachment and non-attachment to your body? <laughs> how, how far along are you? How attached are you still to your body? So I said that, or I mentioned that maybe in the last sutra at some point, but now I kind of want to say it again regarding the giving up anything external or internal. I've talked or I've mentioned a lot about the, and this is in Dharmador's past, but I've mentioned a lot about how this idea of ourselves, meaning the idea of a self, like an ego or whatever, the idea of the self, I've often pointed out how 
And, and let's remember from a Buddhist point of view that self thing is just a concept. It's just an idea. It's a delusion, right? But that delusion, as I've pointed out, it arises from a certain kind of tension between what is being perceived as external versus what is being perceived as internal. So what I mean is, is that the very idea of, <clears throat> of inside me and outside of me, well, in between those two ideas, meaning in between the idea of outside, external, and internal, because you have those ideas of outside and inside, you have the idea of a self. Or because you have the idea of a self, you have the ideas of inside and outside. So it's a dependent origination thing going on here. And of course, what I like to always point out is, you know, are, are your teeth inside or outside? And it's tricky because if they're out, I mean, it's tricky because they are outside, but they're inside. They're like, so my point is the line between inside and outside, it's made up. There is no line between inside and outside, but we imagine that there is such a thing when we say my internal organs and my external stuff. So my point again is that the Dharma is suggesting that there is no self in this juxtaposition of internal and external. It's a delusion. So anybody coming along and suggesting that you relinquish all things internal and external, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's a liberating idea. So anybody asking you to give up all things internal or external is trying to liberate you. So. <laughs> That's all about that. <laughs> okay. Okay to go on? Yeah, no, please. <laughs> I have a question about some a different thing, I think, mm -hmm. of the part, which is that the the I think that he used the word, I think you read the word, and then I think in the other translation it's a different word but i think shariputra used the word fear that they don't have fear and, it, mm. and I think it's really interesting because i think we usually think of you know if someone walks up and says hey can i have your shirt <laughs> you're like no it's my shirt you don't not give it out of fear you don't you not give it out of sort of a greed or a mm. you know and and so I'm just thinking it's an inter it's interesting, but but I mean, if someone wanted my eye, then I could see that I'd be afraid. But it, I just think it's an interesting. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between greed and fear? And it's just something to think about. I don't know. What what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I was going to check to see. So. Yeah, you're, you are right, Noam, of course, that it does say that Shariputra says, I often think that if a bodhisattva is not afraid or faint hearted, even when forced to give up all that they have in external and internal, that they must be an inconceivably liberated bodhisattva. Normally, and it's going to come up, so I'm not kind of speaking out of turn in this sense, the language about, especially when it's somebody like Shariputra, a Shravaka, a person from the Hinayana saying about the Bodhisattva <clears throat> that they don't have any fear. The normal thing that that's referencing is that Shravakas, like people of the Hinayana, are considered to be afraid of samsara. They're, they're like afraid of it. And so that's why they want to get to nirvana so that they won't have any more fear. But the idea is, is they're fearful of samsara. The bodhisattva, of course, jumps right back into samsara like a jacuzzi, 
he just keeps jumping back in, has no fear of the lower realms, has no fear of samsara. And so I think it's kind of more referencing that aspect. And by the way, what in fact, I think it's about to happen. Oh yeah, it's the next, it's the next sentence. So the Buddha says to Shariputra, after saying this about the bodhisattvas not having fear or being faint-hearted, the Buddha says, so it is, so it is. It's just as you say. No Shravaka or Pratikyabhuta can know the state of wisdom, upaya, and samadhi in which these bodhisattvas dwell. Shariputra, these great bodhisattvas, like Buddhas, can perform miraculous feats to satisfy the desires of sentient beings, while their minds remain unmoved by anything, by any dharma. So again, we're about to start, um, Noam, in reference to your question, we're about to start making this distinction between the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas and these noble bodhisattvas. So, all right. So yeah, let's keep going because I totally would love to get to a little section here towards the bottom of this page. So the Buddha also says to Shariputra, Regarding the bodhisattvas, if sentient beings are fond of the household life, if they're haughty, if they're unrestrained, these bodhisattvas can appear as great laymen of awesome virtue to teach those sentient beings the Dharma so that they may be brought to maturity. If sentient beings with great strength become arrogant, the bodhisattvas can appear in the form of a gigantic Narayana, who is Vishnu. So if you know the Hindu god Vishnu, a bodhisattva can appear in the form of a gigantic Vishnu and explain the Dharma to these arrogant people so that they may be subdued. Now, this is what I wanted to get to. If sentient beings wish to seek nirvana, these bodhisattvas can appear as shravakas and explain the dharma to them, thereby liberating them. But if sentient beings like to contemplate dependent origination, the bodhisattvas can appear as pratekya buddhas and explain the dharma to those sentient beings, thereby liberating them. And if sentient beings wish to attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, Supreme Enlightenment. These Buddhas, sorry, these Bodhisattvas can appear as Buddhas and lead those people into the Buddha wisdom, thereby liberating them. Okay, so I really wanted to like spend a few minutes on that section. So there's a certain idea Actually, it's a it's a it's a a sequence of ideas that I am often talking about, and I feel like I have finally found like my good sutra reference for for this because this is an idea that I have come to an understanding of over lots and lots and lots of Dharma study, but it's like I finally found the exact reference. And what it is, it's the idea that the Shravaka path the early path, the Hinayana path, that's about getting to nirvana. But if you haven't heard it from me, the way that I understand nirvana, and it's not, I mean, it's the way I understand it, but to me, this is the way that it is spoken about in the sutras. And what it is, is that nirvana which you may remember, literally the word nirvana means blown out and therefore is often translated as cessation, gone out. Well, nirvana, the blowing out or the cessation is defined as the blowing out, the eradication and cessation of the three poisons, greed, anger, and delusion. Delusion, the third poison, is confusion. It's moha, 
confusion, but it's confusion about the self. And in particular, the third poison, the third poison is something like arrogance, something like um, feeling like feeling less than, right? A feeling of shame, guilt. We need to notice that those kinds of emotions, the emotions around like shame and guilt and even arrogance, excessive pride and vanity, they're all predicated on a self. You would not have any shame if you didn't have that sense of self that you were trying to preserve and compare to other people and compare to society and do all these things that, that self, selfing does. So the third poison is about all of these afflicted emotional mind states that have to do with having a deluded sense of self. And then on top of that, there's the greed and the anger, the addictive desirousness and the fear and the anger, the fight or flight mode. So those are the poisons. Those are the three poisons. And what I want you to notice is, is that like greed, anger, and shame, those are like emotions. There are troublesome, afflicted emotional states. So nirvana, this idea of nirvana, it's about the cessation of greed, anger, and confusion. It is about not having addictive desire anymore at all. It's completely gone and blown out. It's about not getting angry anymore at all. It's gone. It's blown out. And it's about not obsessing about self anymore. It's gone. It's blown out. That's nirvana. And that's what the shravaka is after. Peace of mind. That's what a shravaka is after. Nirvana. Peace of mind in that way. Then we come to a pratekya buddha, a solitary enlightened one. So you'll notice here that it says, if sentient beings like to contemplate dependent origination, then the bodhisattva appears as a pratekya buddha and teaches the dharma. A pratekya buddha, as I'm, I'm often saying, what makes a Buddha a Buddha, what makes an awakened one an awakened one, or an enlightened one an enlightened one, is that they understand dependent origination. And that constitutes wisdom. It constitutes vipassana. It constitutes insight. It constitutes, again, awakening. But it's different than nirvana. What I mean to say is, is that a shravaka, part of, someone who's part of the Hinayana, is not necessarily enlightened. Someone who is in nirvana is not necessarily enlightened. If someone is in nirvana, it just means they have no more greed, no more anger, no more delusion about self. But if people are interested in wisdom and enlightenment and like to think about dependent origination, then they can contemplate dependent origination and understand that. And that's called being a Buddha, being an awakened one. Now, because according to Buddhism, dependent origination is what's going on. It's like not the opinion of the Buddha. It's a statement about what's going on. What that means is, is that that understanding is available to everyone always because it is just the truth of what is happening in a way. And so it can so happen that someone just comes to an understanding of dependent origination. And therefore, they are an awakened Buddha. But 
they don't really know how to explain what they understand. They are, they get it, but they don't know how to explain it. And therefore they don't have a following students. And that's what makes them a solitary Buddha. They're just an awakened Buddha, but they're kind of of no help to anybody else because they're not sharing the wisdom of dependent origination. But what I want you to notice is that the association of shravakas with nirvana, pratekya buddhas with dependent origination. And then the third category here is for those sentient beings who wish to attain anuttara samyak sambodhi, supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. For those people, and this is where it, of course, gets interesting. For those people, bodhisattvas appear as Buddhas and teach them the Dharma as Buddhas. So that's an interesting skill of the bodhisattva, which is to appear as a Buddha. It's why I mention, or I've mentioned in the past, that in the Mahayana tradition, the bodhisattva starts to kind of outshine a Buddha a little bit because a bodhisattva could appear as a Buddha, could appear as a Shravaka, could actually appear as a god. Actually, a bodhisattva could appear all kinds of ways, whereas a Buddha is just a Buddha in that sense. So again, in the Mahayana, it's almost as if the bodhisattva becomes a preferable position to even a Buddha. So. Okay, so everybody okay with all of that? Cool. So, ah, right, and this was the last part. Oh, we got to the last part that I wanted to get to. So the last uh, kind of portion on page 264 here, the Buddha says, thus, Shariputra, these bodhisattvas employ various upaya, various skillful means to perfect sentient beings and cause them all to dwell securely in the Buddha Dharma. Why? Because only the Tathagata's wisdom can result in liberation and ultimate nirvana. There is no other vehicle that can carry one to salvation. It's for this reason that the Tathagata is called a Tathagata. Because the Tathagata knows Tathata, thusness or suchness, as it is, they are called a Tathagata, a thus come one. Because a Tathagata can do anything that sentient beings wish, they are called a Tathagata. Because they have perfected the root of all wholesome dharmas and cut off the root of all unwholesome dharmas, they are called a Tathagata. Because they can show sentient beings the path to liberation, they are called a Tathagata. Because they can cause sentient beings to avoid wrong paths and remain on the right path, they are called a Tathagata and because they can explain the true meaning of the emptiness of all dharmas. They are called a Tathagata. Um, yeah, let me just read this last little paragraph. Shariputra. A bodhisattva knows the various aspirations of sentient beings, and by preaching the dharma to them accordingly, liberates them. The Tathagata reveals true wisdom to ignorant people. They can produce all kinds of illusory splendors without affecting the Dharma Dhatu and cause sentient beings to move gradually towards the shore of Nirvana. Actually, that's a Bodhisattva that can do all of that. Sorry. Okay. So let's back up and just spend the little quick few minutes talking about that section on about the Tathagata. I would really like to just summarize that for you really quickly. So this is something that happens every now and then in Mahayana sutras. 
and you get this sort of like um, various reasons why a bodhisattva is called a bodhisattva. Various reasons that the Tathagata is called the Tathagata. So this goes through a bunch of reasons, but I just want to focus actually on that one, which is that because the Tathagata knows Tathata as it is, they're called a Tathagata, a thus come one. So really qu super quickly, we just want to know that there's this idea of Tathata, suchness or thusness, as it is ness. And, you know, again, it's too, a little too late to get deep into the suchness or the thusness. So I'm going to have to just hope or rely on that you already know about suchness or thusness. But the idea is, is that you have this idea of tathata. And then you have this Sanskrit word, gata or agata, which means um, like arising. It kind of is about birth, but it doesn't exactly mean birth, but it does mean like a coming out of in a way. For me, it's sort of the images of a, of a breached whale, a whale coming out of the water. That is like gata in that way. And so what is happening with the word tathagata is that it's actually the word tathata with gata literally coming out of the middle of the word. It's, it's wild. It's like literally like etymological magic where you have this word suchness, tathata, and then the idea of arising out of suchness. And that is what a tathagata is, is one who arises out of thusness. It's literally what tathagata means. So that's sort of what they're referencing as far as that one, that a tathagata knows tathata, in fact, comes out of tathata in that way. All right, and on that beautiful note of coming out of thusness, uh, we will pause here and that'll be the end of the first session of this sutra. Any last questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Oh, yeah, Maria. Oh, can I do it? We're working on it, we're coming, we're coming. Um, just a request that we come back to this without affecting the Dharma dot to. I know it was on my list. We okay. will we'll pick up there next time. Totally. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Yep. All right. That's gonna do it, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.